Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, Delaware is really the locus of activity when it comes to uh, corporate law and corporate litigation in the United States. And one of the major reasons for Delaware being the center of this activity, um, it's widely reported as being the excellence of the courts in Delaware, that litigants know that they can get a fair and prompt hearing from a bench that is widely perceived as being extraordinarily expert in matters relating to business law, corporate law, uh, and anything related to that. Um, and one reason why Delaware has that reputation really is the skill, dedication, and, and intelligence and experience uh, of the attorneys who serve on the Delaware Court of Chancery. There which, are other theories, too. There are other theories, but they're, they're baseless. They're meritless. They, they, they have no value whatsoever. They're like flat earth theories. Um, but uh, one of the reasons very simply is you go into Chancery Court, you're going to wind up having your case heard by a person who is extraordinarily knowledgeable with regard to the matters that are going to be facing you. Uh, it's not going to be a random jury of 12 people uh, that have never addressed a complex business matter before. You're going to be able to get a resolution quickly, all right? And if there's an issue, you're going to be able to appeal it up. But in many situations, you get the resolution in chancery. That solved the matter. Uh, you, you resolve the dispute, and life moves on. Um, and again, uh, many of the people who serve as chancellor and vice chancellor do so at no small personal sacrifice. Um, being in the world of public service uh, today really is a calling. Uh, and I think it's very important that we uh, honor the people who are willing to uh, serve uh, in a variety of different capacities. Uh, and in that, uh, from that perspective, I uh, hope that we'll give a very warm welcome to the Honorable Sam Glasscock III. This is not any old Sam Glasscock, I want you to know. <laughs> this is Sam Glasscock III, the, the Vice Chancellor of the Delaware Court of Chancery. And if you don't know what the appropriate way is to address a vice chancellor, it's your holiness. <laughs> I'll accept your worship. Okay. Your I appreciate holiness. that introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse me. I appreciate very much your, your asking me to come here and speak to you. Um, I thank you for that introduction, and I thank you all for the, for the invitation um, I, I look around, I see people here. I, I spoke at, at Santa Clara Law School earlier today. There were students there as well. I, I was gratified that my reputation had preceded me. Then I found out they were giving away free pizza to anyone who showed up. So um, I, I'm, glad you're, I'm glad you're here without the pizza. Uh, this is my first trip to Stanford campus. It's beautiful, incredibly beautiful. Those of you who are students are lucky to be here, getting a fine education and such a stunning set of surroundings. I got educated. I went to law school at a lovely spot as well. I went to Duke University in North Carolina. And whether due to stupidity or masochism, I remained a Duke football fan. Now Duke got a chance to play Stanford this year, and I figured without Andrew Luck, this was our chance to sneak in and steal a win. And I was thrilled, was thrilled, when Duke came in and hung 13 big points on the card, 13 points. Now, it would have been even sweeter if Stanford hadn't scored 50 against Duke. But, you know, when you're a Duke fan, that's, uh, that's what you come to expect. Now, you know from that introduction, I'm a judge, a vice chancellor in the Delaware Court of Chancery. My court is well known for its corporate decisions. And I would imagine as a result of that, most of you think of the Chancery Court, and that is to the extent you think of it at all, as a business court. Strictly speaking, that's incorrect. The traditional law I apply as a vice chancellor is not business law, but equity and fiduciary relations. That is, mine is a court concerned with institutionalized fairness. I intend to talk to you about a few current issues in corporate law that I hope will be of interest to you. But before I turn to that, I think it'd be useful, perhaps even interesting, for you to hear a little bit about what the Court of Chancery is and why, although it was not established as a business court, it is widely regarded as the premier corporate court in the country. This will also touch on why such a small and frankly obscure state as Delaware should be home to so many corporations. Now, I think it was Will Rogers who said that the difference between a storyteller and a lecturer is that the purpose of a storyteller is merely to entertain his audience, while the aim of a lecturer is to annoy. 
So I'm going to try to make this part of my presentation more of a, more of a story and less of a lecture. The Court of Chancery, together with the Delaware Supreme Court, is among the main draws for companies deciding where to incorporate. These companies choose Delaware with astounding frequency. There are only three counties in Delaware. My home county is Sussex, and we're fond of bragging, if bragging is the right word, that we have more chickens than we have people. Delaware has more corporations than it has people. Now, let me, let me repeat that. With due deference to Mitt Romney, Delaware has more corporations than human beings. Delaware as a state exists because of a dispute between William Penn and Lord Calvert, and because Penn wanted his colony to have an outlet to the sea. We're one of the original 13 states, and we consider ourselves the first state because we were the first to ratify the Constitution. Delaware is 90 miles long, and it averages under 20 miles wide. It's really just a coastal strip on the west shore of Delaware Bay. Now, are there any Delawareans or Rhode Islanders here? No, I didn't, I didn't think so. I don't know if a Westerner, a Californian, can really understand how small Delaware is. Delaware is smaller than the Death Valley Monument, smaller than Monterey County. It would fit with room to spare along the coast between L.A. and San Diego, and it has less people than San Jose. So it's a, it's, it's a little state. What draws all these companies to this, to this little state? Well, it's not, as I found during my brief time here on the peninsula, our irresistible climate, nor our physical beauty. It's also not, as some have suggested, Delaware's favorable tax treatment of corporations. That's a myth. It's true that Delaware does not tax the income of corporations that don't do business there, but Delaware has among the highest franchise taxes of any of its peers. The franchise tax and related revenues provide 40%, 40% of our state budget. So as you can see, the tax treatment is, is not the draw. The tax treatment is a tremendous benefit to the state. So if it's not the tax treatment, what does it lead companies to incorporate in, Delaware, in the Blue Hen State? Did I, did I mention we call ourselves the Blue Hen State? Delaware is known as the first state, the Blue Hen State, the state that started a nation, the Peach State, the Diamond State, among other monikers. Also, I guess I could add the state of many nicknames. In any event, why Delaware? The answer is what former Chancellor William Chandler called the Delaware Advantage, which represents the combination of a superb and responsive enabling statute, an efficient division of corporations under the Secretary of State, an efficient and learned appellate court, a justly renowned bar, and last, but I hope not least, the Court of Chancery, a specialized court that handles the bulk of the business disputes involving Delaware corporations. The Court of Chancery is known for its jurisdiction over matters in equity. Now, as I mentioned, my court is a trial court, but it is not a typical one. For instance, the judges decide issues of fact. As, as you heard in my introduction, there are no jury trials. So the five judges on the Court of Chancery who have become experienced in business disputes, uh, appearing before them allows the litigants to concentrate on presenting their cases and not educating a jury about the fine points of Delaware corporate law. The Court of Chancery's defining characteristic, however, is that its jurisdiction is limited, and it's limited to matters in equity. Now, what is equity? Well, you know what the word means. It means fairness. But in the legal context, equity is simply a set of principles and remedies emanating from the concept of fairness that were developed in the English court system beginning centuries ago. It is, in fact, the English Court of Chancery's equity jurisdiction as of 1776 that provides the model for our Court of Chancery's jurisdiction. The English Court of Chancery is long gone, abolished in the late 1800s due to the perceived inefficiencies of a dual court system. If you've read Charles Dickens' Bleak House, you know what I'm talking about. But the Delaware Court of Chancery remains an anachronism that nonetheless interprets and applies what is effectively, I would submit to you, the corporate law of the United States. More than 50% of the Fortune 500 companies are incorporated in Delaware, and um, our corporate jurisprudence extends to a wide number of the corporations in the United States. Now, equity's path from a concept of fairness to the foundation of American corporate law is somewhat of an accident of history, a history that really begins in 13th century England. Now, you'll be relieved to know I won't be describing the history of the Court of Chancery from the 13th century on, but to understand the modern Court of Chancery it's important to understand that the court arose because the law courts at that time had developed an elaborate writ system under which, unless you could fit your case within a particular writ, you could not receive relief. 
That is, if, if, you, if you didn't have a template that you fit within, your case couldn't be heard. Now, if your case did fit within an established writ, all you could receive from the court was money damages. Law courts could not direct the parties to act or refrain from acting, so ongoing wrongs like trespass could not be remedied by an order to desist. Litigants who felt they'd been treated unfairly or that the common law courts could not remedy their injury had one recourse, an appeal to the king. Petitioners had to demonstrate that the common law did not provide an adequate remedy in order to receive the king's attention. And in the late 13th century, these position, petitions became commonplace. And Edward I, who I'm sure preferred being a king to a judge, I would myself, began deferring them to his Lord Chancellor. The Lord Chancellor was an advisor whose position was often referred to as the keeper of the king's conscience. And he was responsible for delivering justice on behalf of the king and was for a long time a high-ranking church official. The petitions for equity were eventually addressed directly to the chancellor, and this practice led to the establishment of a separate tribunal, the Court of Chancery, for hearing petitions from individuals seeking equitable relief, which was dispensed on principles of fairness rather than a strict application of statute or precedent. Now, one area became particularly important to the Chancery docket because of the inflexibility of the law courts in addressing it. And that is that the law courts did not recognize the rising importance of an emerging relationship among individuals, the trust. The origin of trust doctrine, that person A transfers ownership in B for the use of C, are far outside the scope of this speech. My limited understanding is that the land trust arose as a device to subvert limitations on transfers of real property during the feudal system. In any event, the concept of transferring property or funds to, trust, to a trustee to hold as a fiduciary for a third party or for the transferor himself created a relationship different from the mere contractual rights that could be enforced at the common law. Enforcing such notions of fidelity on the part of trustees in equity filled a need unmet at common law and was important to the development of chancery as a corporate court in ways I will describe. Now, while the chancellor's decisions could provide fairness, one man's fairness is another man's arbitrariness. As a long ago critic of the court famously opined, equity is a roguish thing. For the law, we have a measure, know what to trust to. Equity is according to the conscience of him that is chancellor. And as that is larger or narrower, so is equity. Tis all one as if they should make the standard for the measure we call a foot a chancellor's foot. One chancellor has a long foot, another a short foot, a third an indifferent foot. It is the same thing in a chancellor's conscience. At any rate, over the centuries, the chancery court grew into a parallel court system, operating where a remedy of law, uh, operating where a remedy uh, at law for money damages was inadequate, or as with trusts unavailable, operating without a jury, providing positive relief with the chancellor as the alter ego as a king. As I've said, this was a system in England, and absent the king, it is a system in Delaware today. It has been abandoned almost everywhere else. Think about why. It seems on its face inefficient to have two parallel systems of courts existing in one jurisdiction, one sitting without a jury and doing equity, the other sitting with a jury and doing law. This was perceived to be particularly true, as I've said, in mid-19th century England, by that time, the Court of Chancery had developed the same set of rigid precedents associated with the law courts, and so, so Chancery provided no real uh, advantages as a separate entity. The legislatures of almost all the American jurisdictions agreed, and nearly all the states have merged their courts of law and equity, including California. The separate court systems were felt to be a needless inefficiency. Delaware's divided system is an anachronism, yet it remains. Well, why should that be? When I was a kid, one of my favorite books was a book about a fish called the coelacanth. I was a pretty weird kid. The coelacanth was a primitive fish, and it was well represented in the fossil record from before the time of the dinosaurs, but it was thought to have gone extinct with the dinosaurs. Scientists were surprised, therefore, to find one alive, if not well, in a fish market in Durban, South Africa in 1938. The coelacanth had many primitive features. It had lobed fins, so it couldn't swim very well. It didn't have a swim bladder. It couldn't maintain its depth. But clearly it had advantages, advantages that let it thrive while all its peers, one by one, passed away. The Court of Chancery is like that coelacanth. To understand why, you have to remember that the Court of Chancery is a special court of equity, of fairness. Part of its traditional jurisdiction in England and in this country, as I have described, involved the law relating to trustees, 
more broadly, the law governing fiduciaries. A fiduciary is merely one who's required to be faithful. You know, fiduciary just means faithful when in Latin. We used to name dogs Fido. It just meant faithful. Adusti fidelis, come ye faithful. The law of fiduciaries is the law of those who have control of the property of others who must be faithful to the true owners of the property. Historically, this included trustees who had title to property but must use it not for their own benefit but for the benefit of the true owner. In other words, they would act as a fiduciary. Chancery oversaw trustees, also guardians who were simply trustees of trusts imposed by law on individuals who were not competent to act on their own, the very young or the senile, for instance. Um, Chancellor, Chancery also oversaw executors of decedent's estates who, once again, control the property of the decedent until the estate is wound up and it's distributed to the true owners, the, the um, beneficiaries under the will or of the estate, the heirs under the estate. So we, we, um, we acted uh, to enforce fiduciary rights, and as time went on, that began to apply to the officers and directors of corporations. Now, a corporation, of course, is an artificial entity, and it derives its power from the government of the state of its incorporation. A corporation has only whatever power is allowed to it by the legislature of the state in which it's incorporated. Originally, state laws for corporations were all very restrictive. Incorporation itself required a special act of the legislature. The corporation was permitted to exist only for a stated specific purpose. Imagine a Silicon Valley startup limited to producing only a single type of service and having to amend its charter to pursue every innovation. And you get an idea of the lack of flexibility of the early corporate form. Now that slowly began to change around the country in the 19th century and the corporate form became more flexible and thus more desirable to business people. Now, in the early years of the 20th century, Delaware passed a very liberal corporations law, liberal in the sense that it allowed maximum flexibility. And it allowed corporations to incorporate simply by following certain requisites and by filing papers with the Secretary of the State. That is, new corporations were no longer required to receive an act of a legislature. And the law also allowed businesses to operate for any lawful purpose. No longer was a specific business intent required. This law, combined with innovations and in laws in other states, created the modern corporation. Now, the Delaware statute was based on the corporate law of New Jersey. And really, it was cribbed from New Jersey. That state, however, abandoned its competitive advantage under the governorship of Woodrow Wilson, who distrusted power in corporate hands. Now, as a result of Delaware's liberal law, corporations began to come to Delaware. Now, what are corporate directors and officers? Well, they're simply fiduciaries, right? They're fiduciaries who hold the property of the true owners, the stockholders, and have to use and control that property, but must use it for the benefit of the stockholders. If the corporate directors act in their own interest at the expense of the stockholders, they're guilty of a breach of fiduciary duty, just as would be a faithless trustee who misused funds belonging to that trustee's beneficiary. Put in that way, the corporate law is not too different from that applicable to a trustee or to a guardian or to the executive of a state. As I've already described, the law concerning trustees and other fiduciaries were under chancery's jurisdiction for historical reasons. It was natural, therefore, that these disputes should fall to the court of chancery, uh, the corporate dispute should fall to the court of chancery. At the same time, uh, chancery was a one-member court, just the chancellor. Even now, it has only five judges, and so as more corporations incorporated and reincorporated in the state, the judges of the Court of Chancery were repeatedly called upon to decide these corporate fiduciary issues. They quickly became familiar with corporate issues and developed a body of corporate law which gave predictable results to those bringing suit here. And predictability, obviously, is particularly important in the business context because it allows corporate actors to plan and take actions knowing they're permitted by law and likewise avoid actions which the court might strike down. So, like the coelacanth, that old fish, Delaware's Court of Chancery had lasted long enough to recognize the significant advantage of its unique attributes that separate it from the law courts. Not only was it a small court overseen by judges schooled in the law of fiduciary duty, who became experienced corporate judges, but it had other advantages as a corporate court. It could go beyond money judgments and readily issue orders based on equity, and thus could, for instance, enjoin mergers, which were unfair to the stockholders. Importantly, it operated without juries, as I've mentioned. 
Imagine how much easier it is for an attorney to present a complex corporate governance matter to a chancery court judge who's familiar with such issues and needs little education in the general area of corporations versus presenting the same matter to a jury of 12 lay women or men who are undoubtedly skilled at what they do for a living but may have had no experience with corporations or corporate law and who would thus need to be educated in the most basic matters before they could begin to render a reasonable verdict. Also, because no jury was involved, the Court of Chancery could act very promptly where fairness required, if necessary, even rendering decisions within the same day presented. For all these reasons, Chancery proved to be an ideal forum for corporate litigation. The advantages of the Delaware General Corporations Law caused corporations to incorporate or move to Delaware. The aggregation of corporations here provided the impetus for Chancery judges and in their appellate capacity for our Supreme Court to develop expertise in corporate law in turn, that expertise, together with other unique features of the Court of Chancery, as I've described, attracted even more new corporations to Delaware in a kind of recurring feedback loop. This has led to Delaware being the main locus of incorporation among the states, with Chancery as the country's premier corporate trial court, and with the Delaware Supreme Court as its most important state appellate corporate court. Now, for the reasons I've described, them, I've described I'm really not a business judge. I'm just a judge in equity. So, how does a common law judge, a judge in equity, address general issues of ethics and fairness with respect to corporations? Well, the answer is incrementally. For better or worse, in contrast to academics and law students, and actually on reflection it's better, a judge cannot seek out issues. They must seek her out in the form of actual controversies. While judges in my court realize our opinions are scrutinized for statements of corporate norms, as common law jurists, our rulings are limited to the facts presented to us. Our Supreme Court cautioned in a case just last week that the obligation of judges to write judicial opinions on the matter presented is not a license to use those opinions as a platform from which to propagate their individual worldview on issues not presented. And in that same spirit, I'll speak to you anecdotally and give you a couple of examples of recent cases I think would provide interesting fodder for those interested in this area of the law. But first, since I'm I know some of the people here are laymen and others are students at various stages uh, of their law school career, let me give you a very brief background on Delaware corporate law, which as I have said, is just a species of the law of fiduciaries. Taken broadly, corporate law itself is relatively simple. It's understanding the underlying, often very complex circumstances of the challenge transactions and the motivation of the actors that make the practice of corporate law so challenging for practitioners. And I think it is among the most challenging of the various areas of legal practice. The American corporation is premised on the stockholder primacy model. What that means is stockholders own the company. They have the right to control the destiny of the company. But at the same time, stock ownership is dispersed. And it would be impractical for stockholders to efficiently make decisions for the corporation. And you can imagine what such a system of control would look like if every decision required a quorum and a vote by the stockholders. To remedy this problem, the stockholders elect directors who are charged with running the company and making decisions on behalf of the stockholders, and they typically delegate operative control, obviously, to the officers. This separation of ownership and control is what allows corporations to act quickly and with flexibility. However, the separation of ownership and control can also create conflicts of interest, since the interests of the directors are not always going to coincide with those of the stockholders' best interest. To repeat what I've said, the directors are simply fiduciaries. They are holding the property of the stockholders, and as fiduciaries, owe duty of loyalty and care to those stockholders. Pursuant to those duties, directors must do what is in the best interest of stockholders and forego taking actions that would benefit the directors to the detriment of the stockholders. Obviously, this is, this is the most basic and obvious stuff. Now, trustees are fiduciaries. They're charged with husbanding and growing resources that they hold in trust. Risk is anathema to trustees. The direct duties of directors are very different, however. The directors are chosen by the stockholders to embrace risk, which is the essence of corporate opportunity. A strict oversight, post hoc, by stockholders or courts responsive to stockholders would tend to kill risk taking and thus the opportunity for dynamic growth. To give the directors a necessary leeway, Delaware law grants directors deference to act under the business judgment rule. The business judgment rule is very simple. 
the court will not second guess valid business judgments that directors took in the best interest of the stockholders as they saw it. How the rule, rule works in practice is as follows. The plaintiff files a claim challenging an action of the board of directors. The directors respond, gee, the action we took was a valid business judgment. At the time, it seemed like a reasonable course of action. The Court of Chancery then dismisses the plaintiff's complaint because the directors are entitled to discretion in making business judgments. Now, there are exceptions to that business judgment rule, which is a good thing because otherwise I would be out of a job. The first arises when the directors have a conflict of interest. In that case, if the directors prove that a majority of the board is conflicted or interested in the transaction, then the burden of proof at trial is shifted to the board of directors. At that point, the self-interested board of directors would have to prove that the tainted transaction was entirely fair to the stockholders. Otherwise, they've breached the duty of loyalty to the stockholders. And the directors must take their responsibilities seriously. They must make informed decisions. If they fail to inform themselves of the circumstances in relation to which they are acting, they have violated a duty of care to the stockholders. Looked at in this way, the directors have a broad arena within which to operate, free from court interference and subject only to the yearly exercise by the stockholders of their franchise, their right to remove the board. Within this arena of unfettered discretion, when acting as a disinterested and informed board, they can take whatever action they believe is in the corporate interest. Now note that includes good, but risky decisions. It also includes poor decisions. It even includes what appear in hindsight to be downright boneheaded decisions, so long as they were taken by disinterested and informed directors. Now, what's the court's role in this arena? Well, nobody has elected me to a corporate board. I'm unsuited by temperament and by training, as I suspect are most judges, to make corporate decisions. My role is quite limited. It is to define boundaries, acting only in cases where the board has wandered out of this arena into conflict or fiduciary, other fiduciary breach. That area outside the arena, that's judge land. The court does not enter the arena itself. Now, that's the business judgment rule in Corporation 101 as I see it. And I apologize to those of you, you know, you can wake back up if, if, uh, if that's old hat to you, and I know it is to many of you. But I, I think it was useful to go over it. And let me now turn to a couple of problematic cases, uh, including topics which I hope may be of interest to you. First, I turn to this question. To what extent can directors of a corporation award themselves compensation and bonuses under the protection of the business judgment rule, as I've described it? This is one of the issues in a case that I heard earlier this year, Seinfeld versus Slager. Now, I must make it clear, a decision in Seinfeld was on a motion to dismiss. The case is still active. And the facts I'll discuss are only the alleged facts important to that preliminary decision. Please don't get the notion that I found these facts. That awaits trial. Think of these as a hypothetical Seinfeld case, a case, if you will, about nothing. Also, I intend to omit the discussion of the demand requirement in derivative cases, which was important in the real Seinfeld, and look at the facts in later the business judgment rule. Now, in Seinfeld, the plaintiff was a stockholder in a corporation called Republic Services, which, which was in the business of hauling and disposing wastes. The plaintiff had several claims, of which two are of interest here. First, he argued that the directors on Republic's board had breached their fiduciary duties to the stockholders by awarding themselves um, stock awards totaling about $1 million each. Two different, two different awards. Second, he brought a claim challenging a bonus payment to the CEO of the company based on past performance by the CEO. The CEO was retiring, and as part of his retirement agreement, the board of directors agreed to pay him nearly $2 million in cash. This was in addition to a rather generous separation agreement that the company had agreed to earlier. Now, the plaintiff in Seinfeld argued that this payment was a gift, not supported by consideration, and thus amounted to corporate waste. And if I ask you which of these two claims was a stronger claim of corporate wrongdoing, you might reason reasonably say the claim involving the CEO, because it was double the amount paid to the directors, and it took cash from the corporation in compensation for work already completed and already compensated. And yet that larger payment to the CEO is the, involved the claim that I was able to dismiss. The board, with respect to the CEO's decision, was independent and informed. What then must the plaintiff show to demonstrate that the decision of the board was outside the arena I've described to you of unfettered action? Such a plaintiff would have to demonstrate waste. To sustain a corporate waste claim, a plaintiff must demonstrate that the corporation received no consideration at all for the payment made, 
or more broadly, that a transaction was so one-sided that no business reason could exist to support it. Now, you can see from that definition that it would be an unusual compensation agreement indeed to merit a finding that the board had wandered out of the arena of an unfettered action and into judge land. This is the rationale behind such decisions of the Delaware courts as Chancellor Chandler's opinion in the Disney case and my uh, opinion last year involving Goldman Sachs compensation. But Seinfeld's facts go beyond allegations of simple excessive compensation. They involve compensation for work the CEO had already performed and already been compensated for. In such a situation, isn't the retirement bonus a gift and thus waste? Doesn't it amount to a $2 million gold watch in the plaintiff's counsel's memorable phrase? The board in Seinfeld argued not. They pointed out that in return for the bonus, the CEO had signed a release of any claims that the continued goodwill of the former CEO was of value to the corporation, and that the award served to encourage the remaining employees, including incoming officers, to work diligently for the company. I found that the plaintiff had failed to plead that the retirement bonus was altogether without value to the corporation. Thus, it was within the arena I would decline to explore the wisdom of the bonus. The business judgment rule applied, and I dismissed the cause of action. Let's turn then to the board's award of compensation to the directors. In addition to salaries, Republic compensated its employees, officers, and directors pursuant to a stock incentive plan. This stock plan was approved by the stockholders of Republic. For purposes of employees receiving stock awards, the stock plan was administered by the non-employee members of the board of directors. So there's no conflict there. However, with respect to, to the grant of awards to the non-employee directors, the stock plan was administered by the board itself. In other words, the board of directors set its own compensation. Not surprisingly, the Republic, and dire the Republic directors participated in the stock plan and awarded themselves time vesting restricted stock units. In 2009, the board gave each of its members $743,000 in stock awards, and in 2010, each director received $215,000 in such awards. In the complaint, the plaintiff stockholder alleged that these stock grants amounted to corporate waste because they far exceeded similar stock awards at peer companies. The defendant directors responded that they had done nothing wrong. True, they'd awarded themselves the stock units, but the stockholders had pre-approved those grants under the stock incentive plan. Therefore, the crux of the director's arguments was, how can we be disloyal to the stockholders when we're simply administering a plan that they've approved? Now, Delaware's corporate statute authorizes the board of directors to set compensation for directors and officers of the corporation. Setting executive salary is a quintessential board function. And so long as a decision is disinterested and informed, it exists within the era of area, arena of unfettered action. Boards need some discretion in setting compensation because the correct compensation for an officer of a huge corporation like General Motors may be different from that of a startup formed in some college kid's dorm room. The kid is probably, obviously, worth a lot more. So the board's decisions are generally given deference under the business judgment rule because, as I've explained, the court's ill-equipped to make such decisions regarding what is and is not proper compensation. That being said, of course, directors who set their own compensation have an interest that diverges from the stockholders, namely maximizing their own compensation. A board setting a bonus for itself is involved necessarily in a self-interested transaction. When acting in self-interest, as I've described, the directors bear the burden of demonstrating that the transaction was entirely fair to the stockholders. The board in Seinfeld, however, pointed out that its actions, so as I've described, were pursuant to the stock option plan that the stockholders had addressed by majority vote. Did this purge the self-interest was the question. A case quite similar to Seinfeld, the 3Com stockholder litigation, answered that question, yes. In 3Com, the plaintiff made basically the same argument that was made in Seinfeld, that the directors had breached fiduciary duties by awarding themselves stock options pursuant to a shareholder-approved plan. In that case, then-Vice Chancellor Steele, now Delaware's Chief Justice, rejected that claim, finding that the directors who administered a stockholder-approved plan are entitled to protection under the business judgment rule. As a result, the three column directors did not breach their duty of loyalty by acting consistently with the terms of the stockholder-approved plan. Now, hearing that, you may be thinking, well, that's the end of Seinfeld because really the two cases are very similar. But listen to what the court's reasoning was in 3Com. Vice Chancellor Steele wrote, I do not see this case 
as a case of directors independently or unilaterally granting themselves stock options, but instead a case where stock options accrue to these directors under the terms of an established option plan with sufficiently defined terms. Now, following that line of reasoning, there must be some limitation to a stockholder approved plan in order for it to shield the directors under the business judgment rule. After all, how can a plan have sufficiently defined terms if it sets no limit on a board's discretion? In other words, Delaware law does not allow stockholders to consent ex ante to any and all compensation schemes under which directors could award themselves a stock option. Now, with that limitation in mind, in deciding Seinfeld, I turn to the relevant stock plan to determine whether the stock awards have been granted under a plan that could strain the discretion of the directors. The terms of the stock plan were as follows. The board could award up to 10.5 million uh, units under the plan. A maximum of 1.25 million of these shares could be awarded to any one individual during any one financial fiscal year. Using these figures, with a little arithmetic, I noted the stock price was around $25 a share. Assuming that the, there were 12 directors, the board could theoretically award each director 875,000 restricted stock units. At $25 each, the award to each director would be worth over $21 million, and the total would be over $260 million available to be awarded to the board. These were essentially the stock plan's only limits on the director's ability to award themselves stock, and these limits are so astronomically high, in my view, that they're not effectively limits at all. Obviously, these limits were not intended to actually restrain the, what the board was allowed to award itself. The constraint which a stockholder approved stock or bonus plan places on a board exists on a continuum. Though the stockholders approved the plan in Seinfeld, the plan must have some meaningful limit imposed by the stockholders uh, on the board in order for the board to be granted protection under the business judgment rule. A stockholder approved carte blanche to the directors is insufficient. Of course, that doesn't mean that the stock awards granted under an unlimited stock plan are per se invalid. It simply means the directors do not get the benefit of the business judgment rule at the motion to dismiss stage of litigation. At the trial, which is yet to happen, the directors will have the burden to prove that granting the stock, op stock options that they actually did grant to themselves was entirely fair to the stockholders. If they prove that, they'll ultimately be successful at trial. Now, I've said the constraint that any particular stockholder approved compensation plan places on a board of directors exists on a continuum. Three common Seinfeld, if you read them together, indicate that somewhere on that continuum, business judgment rule protections begin to apply. I'm aware this may be cold comfort to boards, unsure as where they exist on that continuum. How best to draw that line is a matter for academics until fact patterns are submitted to the court, which allow us to flesh the matter out. Now, let me turn now to some issues raised in another recent case, Diaz versus Purchase. First, some statistics gathered by the U.S. Chamber of U.S. Chamber's Institute for Legal Reform. Of public companies valued over $100 million that merged or were acquired in the past two years, 91% of those transactions became the subject of multiple lawsuits. Another independent study found that the number of suits challenging proposed M&A transactions increased sixfold between 2005 and 2011. Plaintiff's lawyers have increasingly been bringing claims within a very short time from a merger's announcement, usually mere weeks, sometimes mere hours. Now, this is understandable, since injunctive relief is only possible until the merger is consummated, at which point the eggs have likely been scrambled. These claims often allege multiple bases for recovery. They're often bought, brought in multiple jurisdictions in different courts. Some of these lawsuits challenge the price of the transaction and the overall value for shareholders. Some challenge the process the board used in order to in, uh, approve the transaction. Many challenge disclosures that are circulated to investors in proxy form before a stockholder vote to approve the transaction. Class action claims remedying corporate wrongs add value. Class actions whose claims are not viable drain corporate resources. Unless we believe, and I do not, that better than nine out of 10 of public company mergers involve wrongdoing, too many actions are being brought. The question for me is what's the court's role in this problem? And is the court acting properly? 
Now, let me make it clear what I'm not talking about here. I'm not talking about the broad problem of multi-jurisdiction litigation, um, upon which much academic ink has been spilt and which is uh, worthy of very serious consideration. My concern is narrower. It's with my court's role in setting incentives in these cases and whether we are getting those incentives right. Our Supreme Court recently affirmed a decision by the chancellor in the Southern Peru case, in which my old law firm, Prickett Jones, with 21 lawyers and its co-counsel, achieved an award for stockholders in the amount of about $2 billion, for which the court awarded attorney's fees of $304 million. Now, that's my old firm, $304 million. We've been talking about retroactive compensation. Don't you think a bonus for past employees would be fair? Sounds good to me. The award in southern Peru has, fairly enough, received a lot of attention. But actually, in a sense, this is an easy case, because the benefit of a litigation of the stockholders is clear on its face. It's $2 billion. More problematic to me are cases where the claims involve inadequate or misleading disclosures in connection with the board's request that the stockholders act. And when they are asked to approve, as when they are asked to approve a merger, when directors request stockholder action, the directors have a duty to disclose all information that would be material to a stockholder's voting decision, with the ultimate goal being informed stockholder decision making. Obviously, accordingly, a duty is breached when there is an omission or misrepresentation that a reasonable shareholder would have considered important in deciding how to vote. The court is tasked with examining whether the sought-after information would have significantly altered the total mix of information in the eyes of a reasonable stockholder. That is, to demonstrate a breach of duty, a plaintiff must show that the alleged omission or misrepresentation would have actually been significant to a reasonable stockholder's deliberations. Now, many of the class actions that challenge 90-plus percent of public mergers involve such claims. Without sufficient accurate information, stockholders cannot exercise their franchise, and a vote in favor of a merger is no more than a sham. Looked at in this light, plaintiff's class actions involving improper disclosures are not only beneficial, they are a necessity. Our system relies on class action plaintiffs acting as private attorneys general to, to um, enforce these, um, excuse me, uh, to bring these suits, but the real, prosecute, real prosecuting attorneys are forced to exercise prosecutorial discretion by a number of constraints, such as scarce resources and elections. The near ubiquity of merger litigation acts as a kind of tax, draining corporate resources that could be put to productive use. What is the analog of prosecutorial discretion in the corporate class action suits? In Diaz, I said that it is the ability of bench judges over many diverse jurisdictions to shift fees in a way that discourages overuse and abuse of the class action mechanism while encouraging meritorious suits. Well, that's, you know, that's nice for a judge to say. It's pretty obvious. The hard part is in doing that. I went on to point out that the fact that merger litigation has gone from common to ubiquitous suggests that the current balance of incentives is flawed. Let's look at Diaz. The Perfumania Parallax merger, which was at issue in the case, was announced on, in December 23 of 2011. On December 27 or 29, a plaintiff's firm issued a press release that it was investigating Parlex board for possible breaches of duty in connection with the merger. Excuse me. The plaintiff, Diaz, responded to the press release. and suit was filed on January 30, 2012. By that time, a proxy had been issued. The Diaz plaintiff the plaintiff and Diaz alleged that the board had breached its duty to disclose accurate, adequate information to the stockholders in more than 60 ways. The matter was litigated vigorously and decided after a hearing on Diaz's request for a preliminary injunction. I found that the vast bulk of the disclosure claims were identical or very similar to claims that my court had rejected in other cases. One claim, however, had merit. The proxy indicated falsely that the bankers uh, giving the fairness opinion, had relied on management predictions of future cash flows. In fact, the bankers had created their own estimates of cash flows, and the company had never itself undertaken that exercise. I found that the false imprimatur of Parlock's own estimates of future performance could cause a reasonable stockholder to give more weight to the fairness opinion that was due, and I ordered a supplemental disclosure. The merger offer was for cash and a surplus over the market, 
and the Pollock shareholders approved it despite the disclosure. Now, setting aside the issue of whether I was correct in finding the inaccurate disclosure to be material, how should the plaintiff's attorneys be compensated for achieving this result? What is fair to them? What is fair to the stockholders? And pertinent to this discussion, what is the proper amount to incentivize meritorious actions and discourage the other kind? Diaz counsel sought $500,000. Now let me say first that I am constrained by the concern that equity not be reduced, to use the words I quoted earlier, to the fortuity of the length of the chancellor's foot. In Diaz, I relied on the factors set out by our Supreme Court to determine fee awards, chief among them the results obtained here, a single disclosure corrected, but also including the effort expended by counsel. I looked at other cases involving similar result, uh, results achieved at an equivalent stage in the litigation, for which our courts have typically awarded around $400,000 in fees. I then cut the fees in recognition of the fact that the effort expended on the valid claim must have been only a fraction of that expended on the case in its entirety, and that the corporation had been forced to litigate, in addition to one meritorious claim, 60-odd non-colorable claims. Now, ultimately, I awarded about half the fees sought. But the broader concern in cases like Diaz is this. What is the value to stockholders of such litigation? How many non-meritorious actions are simply settled with the corporation agreeing to a few supplemental disclosures to minimize litigation costs and allow a valuable transaction to go forward? And how can judges discourage those types of litigation without discouraging meritorious litigation as well? Once again, I have the luxury of not answering such questions myself, professionally at least, until they're neatly presented and well argued by zealous counsel. That is the beauty of being a judge rather than an academic or a law student. Faced, therefore, with these difficult questions, I can simply say that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening to me, and if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to try to answer them.